I'm Luca Giliberti, contributing writer for Gold Derby, and I'm joined today by Dana Stevens, who wrote the screenplay for The Woman King. So Dana, um, to start things off, I would like to go all the way back to the beginning. Um, what about the original idea for this film and the lookbook I believe you got to see enticed you into signing on to this project and really into familiarizing yourself with such a complex piece of history? Yeah, well, the number one thing was Viola Davis. I, I am a gigantic Viola fan to the point where uh, when she was first nominated for the Oscar, I really wanted her to win and I was a voter and it was like President's Day or something. And I was worried that my ballot would not be counted, that it would not make it to the Academy. And I drove it to the Academy and put it in a box because I just think Viola is, is the most dynamic actress uh, working in film right now. And so Right away, I was like, anything, anything Viola would give me, I would look at. And then I was blown away I, immediately. They, they, they sent me some articles. They sent me a book and the amazing look book that has Viola in it and um, and just uh, images of the Agoji. Um, but the thing that was the most uh, eye-opening and actually annoying is how nobody knows this story. Yeah. Um, that that uh, Americans do not know about other cultures and other cultures' histories. And uh, I, I was aware that um, in Black Panther, that the Denai Guerrero character, that those women were based on mm -hmm. um, women warriors, but I, but I really didn't know that much about it. And, um, and once I started delving into this material, I felt like it was as juicy and epic and textured as you know, Gladiator or or Game of Thrones, you know, I just felt like yeah. this is an, uh, a fascinating world. And uh, I, you know, worked up a pitch for, you know, there's 200 years of, of Goji history. Yeah. So I'm sure I wasn't the only writer pitching how I would tell this story. And um, so, you know, the, 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 the project started with Maria Bello, mm -hmm. Um, having been in Africa, having heard about the Agoji, sh she went to Viola and to Kathy Schulman and got them involved. And then they were looking for a writer. Mm -hmm. And I, um, you know, took their research, but also looked for more research because there's just not that much. To, and I was looking for whatever I could find that would give me a clue as to how, what time period I wanted to set it in. And the mm -hmm. The year 1823 was very specifically chosen in my pitch. And another thing in my pitch that was pretty specific was that Nawi and Naniska do not know that they are mother and daughter. And the idea of the shark's tooth in the shoulder. Mm. I can remember when I was doing my pitch, and this happens to writers when you're pitching, you can just kind of feel when they go, oh, oh, you uh, know, they like that. And when I pitched the shark's tooth thing, I thought, oh, okay, you know. And uh, that is one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Oh, yeah. It absolutely is. And we'll get to that uh, in just a bit. But, you know, going back to um, the setting, because I had read that, uh, you know, in the original pitch deck, the film was actually set in 1890. And then you ultimately decided that you wanted it to be set in 1823 instead. So could you talk about the motivation behind that decision and why you had your eyes set on that year in particular? Yeah, well, um, the 1890s are, uh, one thing I felt was that it was a little too recent. I mm -hmm. I felt like I don't want to see, you know, when people in bustles and, you know, it just felt, it felt uh, a little too modern. Second of all, the, the Agoshi are wiped out by the French and I did not want to see the Agoshi wiped out once I got into who they were and was imagining, you know, the key to this movie is what imagining what the Agoji think and, and what is at stake for them because they're the main characters. And in a lot of this history, the Agoji are just lumped together as a group. You know, they don't have a lot of individuality. Mm. And um, so I didn't want them to be wiped out. I, I, I didn't want to see a bunch of, you know, French Foreign Legion guys with the, it just didn't feel right. Mm. And um, so as I started looking back and looking at the different kings, that's a way to locate yourself in the different time periods. In, in the movie, Gezo is the only character that you can actually look up 
as a as a real historical character. And um, uh, basically, I was reading a book about Ouida, and, and they mentioned this 1823 battle between the Oyo, who had been um, sort of, uh, they had been kind of, um, it had to pay tribute to the Oyo because the Oyo were so much more powerful and the Dahomey had defeated the Oyo. And I also wanted, frankly, to go ahead and talk about the slave trade in the movie. Right. As I anticipated that the, that people would, um, uh, some people, certainly Africans, would know about the Dahomey people and know that um, uh, they captured their enemies and sold them into slavery. And so I felt like we have to talk about that. We can't ignore it. Mm -hmm. And so 1823 was also a time when the slave trade was in disarray. The English had outlawed it and they were patrolling the waters. They were taking the enslaved people off the ships and returning them home. So the slave trade was essentially illegal. And also, I loved the fact that Gezo was a young, sexy king who had been brought to power by a coup of the Agoji. You know, the Agoji had fought for him. So I just thought, what an amazing relationship between Naniska, Viola Davis, as this, you know, battle-torn warrior mm -hmm. and this young, hot king. And she thinks, maybe this is a chance that I could advocate for change. And so it just seemed like I had hit upon a time period where we could um, portray them as triumphant. We could ask the audience to look at these different issues about the slave trade, et cetera. That's such a fascinating insight. Thank you. And I, what I, what is really great, great about the filming, you just touched on that, is that we get to see the Agogia not just as a group, but also as individuals um, mm -hmm. in their full complexity, and especially in Naniska Viola's character, who you can tell has lived a full life. Mm -hmm. So how did that character really come to fruition, and what about and what was the inspiration behind her backstory and the way it was woven into, into this story? Uh, well, um, when the project came to me, Maria Bello had had this idea about Viola's character, Naniska, having been raped mm -hmm. as a young woman. And we all felt like rape as a weapon of war was a huge thing that we wanted to have in this story. Because we all felt if you're a woman warrior, you're putting your body on the line. Mm -hmm. Even women that are civilians in war are, are uh, suffering this kind of violence. Uh, and so we felt we wanted to have that in the story. Um, the original sort of lookbook had that, that Nawi and Naniska knew that they were mother and daughter. Um, and one of the things in my pitch, which I think I already have said, is that I thought it would be interesting if they did not know that they right. were mother yeah. and daughter. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted the movie to have a kind of almost mythic quality. I, wa I wanted it to feel like a, a hero's journey with you know, uh, like destiny at work, you know, in it. And so it it was interesting to me to imagine that this thing you could never think happened has happened. And in fact, that was a big part for me in, in, in sort of discovering how to write Naniska's character. I was very interested in Naniska being a person who had uh, experienced trauma. I talked to a trauma psych psychologist and mm. I was very interested to think about what her leadership would be like as a person who's just stuffed down those feelings and has decided, you know, emotion is weakness. Um, and then she runs into her rapist in Oba and she's just frozen mm -hmm. and the emotions are starting to come up for her. Um, the other thing that I thought was just a very hero's journey aspect to the Naniska character is that what she's done is cut herself off from her young self, her young wounded self. And then she, because she becomes connected to Nawi as a young trainee, all those emotions are coming up for her. And then Nawi is in fact the daughter. So they it, it, it's about how Naniska opens her heart back up to her young self and to her daughter and is able to heal and in fact, even able to be a, a better warrior because she actually um, has the fire in her belly to save uh, Nawi and, um, 
And I think for, for me, one of the things I absolutely love about this movie is that women are really feeling pushed back and pushed against the wall. And I just wanted this movie to be an empowering story about women fighting back because we don't get those action movies. Mm -hmm. We don't get to see our no. characters. And the other thing I, I thought about with Naniska is I looked at other characters like Lawrence of Arabia or, you know, the guy, the, the Russell Crowe character in Gladiator or Braveheart. What are those men dealing with and what is it about them that makes them generals? And uh, so I, I wanted to give that to a woman and what better woman than Viola? That is absolutely true. And uh, to sort of build on that, what I think is also rewarding is that we get to see all these women interact with each other, um, all these different dynamics. One of my favorite moments in the movie is when Amenza, played by Sheila Atim, tells Naniska she wouldn't dare to question her uh, in front of everyone else. I just love that so much. So talk a bit about creating this sense of sisterhood and family that we see among these women. Well, uh, I was immediately in the in the research drawn to the fact that they live together in the palace, that this, that there's a literal palm curtain. And mm -hmm. when he says that line, when you cross this line, you are in a world of women. And um, uh, I, I was very interested in setting up these, these dual friendships, you know, Ezogi Nawi, Amenza, Naniska, because in a lot of ways, Naniska and Nawi function as a love story. You know, they, yeah. they don't, they don't like each other at first. They're circling each other. They they um, are attracted to each other in a, in a way. Um, and so they both need a confidant. They both need someone in their lives that they can turn to um, so we can know what's going on with them internally. And then I was very interested in then, of course, being able to have Izogi and Amenza represent yet another aspect of what these Egoji women were like. They mm -hmm. were they were, uh, you know, they were spiritual. They were, he, you know, they, they healed each other's wounds. They, they, um, they stood by each other. And, um, you know, uh, and Gina also brought a lot uh, of the authenticity of being a Black woman to yeah. this story. Once, once I was starting to work with Gina after I'd done, you know, a couple of years work on the script, Gina came aboard and she was able to say to me, "This we need more authenticity here." You know, it was it, there, the scene between uh, Zogi and Nawi, uh, where she says, "You are powerful. Don't ever forget your power," which is one of another one of my favorite scenes. Was not written to be a scene where Izogi is braiding Nawi's hair. Right. That was Gina's idea, and that is a scene that really resonates with people. And so that you know, that's that's movies. There's there's so much wonderful collaboration and uh you know it was very important that we have Gina as the director of this movie absolutely and that's a perfect segue to my next question because sometimes these dynamics that uh, you were talking about are established or fleshed out through moments of complete silence or or you know scenes in which there's a lot of silence case in point and you've talked you've mentioned this already the second pool exchange between Nawi and Naniska which might be my favorite scene of the entire movie Walk me through the process of uh, constructing that scene and, and how you weighed when to spell something out and, and when not to, to just let the actors do, uh, you know, the heavy lifting, I guess. You're talking about the scene in the baths with the shark suit? Yes, exactly. Um, that scene went through many uh, rewrites, you know, mm -hmm. like, because, <laughs> because uh, it was hard for us to feel how does, how does, Naniska just launch into this story. So one thing that really broke it open for us was when we, and this is something I, I say a lot to writers, you know, make a chain of cause and effect. It, because this happens, this happens. And because this happens, this happens. And mm -hmm. this is a perfect example of it. Nawi sneaks out to see Malik. And because she has the courage to do that, Malik tells her about these other tribes that are going to come and attack them. And because he tells her that, she realizes she has to go find Naniska and tell her this. And we already know that Naniska, and she knows that Naniska bathes late at night by herself, which I also love is it actually something she started doing when she was pregnant. So she goes to see Naniska. And what, what I love about it is Naniska 
takes that opportunity. She doesn't set it up. I don't think Naniska knows in that moment that she's going to let it all come out. And that's what's so um, wonderful about the scene is she has this feeling about now we like you snuck out at, on the night that you took your oath. And then now we being now we kind of yells back at her. What do you want from me? Which is such right. a mother daughter thing to say. Yep. And then it just comes out. And it's so much about two actors listening to each other. It just comes out. She just says, I was raped when I was captured many times. And it gives me chills to think yeah. about it. And, um, you know, and then the the two actors are just brilliant in this scene. They, they um, the way now we listens to, to this information. And then um, one of my favorite lines is when she says, it isn't me. Mm -hmm. When she realizes that this is what Naniska thinks, and she says, it isn't me. And then one of the big things that happened just in production is the end of the scene. We had Gina and I kept tossing out lines for Nawi to say at the end. We had so many, yeah. and we have arguments with the studio and everything. Oh, God. What will Nawi say at the end of this scene? And in the end, I'm sure she shot some of those lines, but she also shot it the way it is in the movie. She doesn't say anything. Mm -hmm. She just kind of stumbles out in this incredible, like, how can this be happening? And that is the best choice. And I'm very happy with, with how Gina directed that scene. Mm. It's always nice to see writers and directors um, trust their actors uh, to convey the emotions. And you really just want to go back to this scene so many times to find all the nuances in Viola's and Tuso and Bedu's performances there, like you said, they're just so good. Um, and to slowly wrap things up, um, I actually want to go back to the beginning, um, to the first battle scene. You know, we start uh, with the battle at Enemy Village. It's what, what opens the movie, which I think is such an interesting choice. So was it always the idea to kick off the movie like this? Or why did you think that would be a good entry point into this story? That was always the beginning. I, I find it for myself as a writer that I can't even start writing until I feel that I know what the opening image yeah. is. And I thought, I read about how they would leave, you know, their their palace to attack people. They would run all night and then they would get closer to where they were going to attack and they would be moving through the grasses um, stealthily and you I, I just thought imagining these grasses waving and you think it's wind and then you understand that it's people it's it's warriors and then they stand up out of the grasses and oh my gosh when when Viola stands up out of the grasses it's so it, it's really exciting and where she does this thing where she goes oh yeah yeah exactly God, it's so great that whole was not in the script but it is awesome oh. Oh, that, I mean, I was completely electrified by the opening battle. Uh, I mean, also, L L Lashana Lynch's smirk, um, there's something that, I don't know, it, it, I think it's such a great way to start the movie, and I really like that we instant, instantly get a sense of what the Agogia's, you know, battle tactics are. I mean, you see the nails, you see the oil on their skin, you see the way they work with each other, and, and then at the same time, there are stakes because they do uh, endure a casualty, so I, I just think it's such an interesting way to set up the movie. Um, well, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so congratulations uh, on the su success of the movie, Dana. Um, and thank you. thank you so much for taking the time to talk about it with me today. It was such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Luca. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm.